So you get mugged in your driveway. What do you do? Our guest today decided to take matters into his hands by educating himself, becoming a firearms instructor, but then he set the goal of educating as many people as he could. He's taught up to 800 people in a single day about their basic firearms rights and how to use firearms. His goal is to teach a thousand. Join us for the story. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-hosts and guests. Do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Descendants of Liberty Network or the To The Republic podcast. Welcome to The Republic, an impossible experiment made possible by remarkable people who dared to ignore both the prevailing wisdom and overwhelming odds, that spirit of independence of challenging the status quo, of doing what others say is impossible, form the core of our nation's identity, and inspire us to this day. This show offers commentary and conversation with individuals who are organizers, educators, inventors, innovators, competitors, hunters, and activists who have ignored preconceived notions and dared to succeed when others turn back or dared not go at all. Join us as we talk to both known and unknown, famous and those on the rise who continue the tradition of making our republic possible. Welcome to the Republic. It's our second official episode. We're pretty excited. And we wanted to reach out to um, yet another awesome example. And we're going to we're going to introduce you to our friend in a second. Rebecca, how are things going in Kansas? Oh, things are pretty calm in Kansas. Everybody's just uh, wrapping up fair season. Oh, (laughs) yeah. The fair fair. season. That's a thing, too, isn't it? Oh, it is. Very much so. Um, And we're all getting ready to buy school supplies and send our kiddos back to school. It is about that time of year. Yeah, we're doing the same. You know, I, um, I Georgia has makes a big deal out of the fair, and Georgia's not too far away, and I should have gone. Uh, and Tennessee, of course, has one, too. Um, and I'm actually curious as to whether our, our other guest goes to the fair. Uh, Rick Ector uh, is our guest today, and he uh, we're going to let him tell his story from the beginning. Um, and we're, we're going to actually let him introduce it because he, he knows it better than we do. But um, Rick is a man who lives in Detroit, and he was a firearms instructor, and he came up with an idea. He had a experience that it's really important to share, so we're going to absolutely do that. So, Rick, welcome to, to the Republic. Welcome to this experiment. Hey, thank you so very much for inviting me to the show. I look forward to the experience, man, and I consider it an honor to be here. We are we're thrilled to have you. So um, you are a firearms instructor. Can you walk us, because I, I, I have the name of your or your group right in front of me on the screen, but what I want you to do is could you share, you were a firearms instructor and you saw something and that changed your thought process. So could you walk us through the whole thing and introduce us to what you did after your, after, after the life experience that happened? Well, I mean, it's like, my life as a firearms instructor, man, it's like a couple of different different stories and they, they match up and they meet and they intersect. But, uh, you know, there's a story about how I became a firearms instructor, you know, as a result of being the victim of a violent crime. And that journey from crime victim to gun rights advocate was just one experience you know, from beginning to end. And then as I was on that journey, when I was on that path, you know, I, I, I had an experience where I wanted to do more, which was uh, some experiences that led to me training women in a big, huge event that I do every year. But uh, let's speak to the training women. Yes, you know, I've been a firearms instructor for uh, a few years. You know, I was getting my feet wet and was really, uh, finding my place in the in in the industry and in the in the movement, and uh, I saw a story in the local media here in Metro Detroit about a woman who had been killed and her body had been dis- had been uh, discarded in the street as if she was trash. 
And, you know, one of the interesting things about that was that just recently here within the past month or so, there have been a couple of people, and at least one of them a woman, you know, have been killed here in Detroit. And yet again, bodies either dumped in the street or dumped in the trash can. And it and it brought me full circle because it reminded me how I became a advocate for the arming of women. So years ago, I saw this news account of this woman whose body had been found in the trash can. And it really disturbed me to my core. I really, truly was distressed by the story and I had been a firearms trainer for a number of years and I really felt that someone should do something about it. And as you just think about it and you think about it, I was like, you know, I was really at a loss as, as to what to do, man. And, uh, I was, you know, just at odds at at what I was going to, you know, how I was going to, you know, address it. And I had been talking with a friend of mine, Ken Blanchard. People may have heard of him. He's written a couple of books, the first of which was uh, Black Man with a Gun that I found years ago. But Ken has gone on to be not only a mentor but a friend. But we had uh, had talked about it, man, and I had shared this idea I had about training women on how to shoot. And Ken was very encouraging, and uh, he gave me uh, some pointers and some tips and he said I should go for it, man. So, so you had what you, I decided to do. You had you had some what? you had you had a conversations, but I mean, no one gave you a manual. Nobody told you how to do your program. You talked with some people you trusted, oh. and and then basically you just started doing it. You know, it's like uh, you you see a problem, you see an issue, and it, it affects you on such a deep level, man, that you know that you want to do something about it, you want to make a contribution. And so I just came up with this idea that I wanted to, you know, be involved with training women how to protect themselves. And, and you know, I had a fairly decent following back then, you know, eight years ago, you know, in social media. And so I thought I would leverage that, man. And I realized that as a relative unknown that, you know, there might be some skepticism about the offer that I was going to present. But undaunted, you know, I I made the offer anyway. I went to social media and anyone I could reach out to, and I put an open call out to women. Any woman that was out there who could see this message or could hear about this message, to get in touch with me and meet me at a gun range on a date that I had selected, and uh, I would give them a free shooting lesson. And I had how did that go eight years shoot. ago? How how did the response from women differ from what it is today? Well, like I said, I was you know relatively unknown. You know, there's this guy. You know, who knows who this guy is, and he just comes out with this offer. And, you know, the things that, that we learn as we age and mature, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, sometimes things are too good to be true. But, you know, I had visions in my mind that I was going to train literally hundreds of women in one day, you know, how to shoot a gun and give them, you know, a free safety briefing, teach them about gun safety. But How many, undaunted, how many women showed up to that first open call? That that first open call, I got 50 women to come out and take me up on my offer. Nice. And, you know, it was it, it was a great thing. And see, here's the thing. Looking back on it now, you know, eight years later, I can say, hey, that was a decent showing, right? But then on that day, my goals and my expectations were so high, I was, like, really disappointed and down in the dumps that I convinced seven or eight fellow firearms instructors. And I, I talked to gun range into donating their facility. And, you know, I had people donating guns and, you know, I paid for the ammo out of my pocket that I could only get 50 women to take me up on a free shooting lesson, you know, in one day. But, uh, you know, and I talked to people and they were like, man, what are you talking about? That was, that was great. That was a one. It was a good thing that you did. And it was a good outing, you know, a good turnout. Yeah, 50 and would be a success. Now, yeah, and looking back on it now, you know, as a promoter of such an event, you know, back then, eight years ago, yeah, I could say it was a great success. But then I didn't know enough 
about what I was doing. It's like uh, my buddy Ken Blanchard says, you sometimes you don't know what you don't know. You yeah. know? And I just didn't know how hard it was to convince people that sometimes things that seem to be too good to be true are actually genuine. So, you know, I, I took that first event, you know, where I got 50 women to come out for a free shooting lesson. And I was, I was encouraged by the results and, uh, I just kept going, man. And, uh, the next year, you know, I was able to go from 50 women to a hundred women. And, you know, again, I was expecting hundreds upon hundreds of women to take me up on this free offer and only a hundred showed up, but uh, I kept going. And then suddenly it was 200 and the progression went to 400 and then 600 and then 700. And then lo and behold, this past uh, Mother's Day, the weekend after Mother's Day, me and my fellow firearms trainers that I got to partner with me, we trained 814 women about firearm safety and how to shoot a gun. And we provided everything for free. Amazing. There was no range fees, no gun rentals, no ammunition costs. I mean, we literally went through thousands upon thousands of rounds of ammo. And uh, the manpower to run such an event is amazing. It's astounding. I had over 60 credential firearms trainers. I had partnered with a gun range to donate their facility. And I even had, uh, you know, people from, you know, the gun community come out and, and network with the people. And we had giveaways and hats and T-shirts and stuff. And it was like a really great event, man. And uh, I'm still not done. I still think that there's more that I can do with this program, man. And I'm still looking to grow it even further next year. That's amazing. So, uh, you know, you've got the growth. You went from 50 to 814. What's the, I mean, mm-hmm. there, are, there are so many questions that this branch, that branch off from this. Like you're, you're, you're having people who are probably some, some, in some cases fearful of firearms, uh, that, I, that, I mean, that alone has got to be, uh, tell us about that. I mean, cause like some of your students have never touched a gun, I imagine. There are literally women from all walks of life who are curious about guns, but they really don't know where to go. You know, they, some are extremely fearful of guns. They just know that there are these scary things, but, you know, their life circumstances are such that, you know, maybe they're in a challenged community. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they're, uh, they're head of household with small children and they're concerned about kids. Maybe they live in a community where there's a high rate of crime, which, you know, sad to say, we have issues here in the city of Detroit and in the metro Detroit. But the fact that they were willing to come out and to take me up on my free offer, you know, it speaks volumes to what I was able to communicate to them. But, you know, there are other women who are experienced. They have taken a class. They gotten their concealed carry license. We call it concealed pistol license here in Detroit. Mm-hmm. And sometimes if they don't have someone to go to the gun range with or they don't feel sufficiently emboldened to take that next step by themselves because, you know, some people, when they're new to stuff, they need someone to, you know, literally, you know, take them by the hand and show them the ropes step by step. And, you know, the fact that I've had some women who come every year, some who will go a couple of years, take a couple of years off, and have come, and there are those who... You know, who literally just heard about this program after eight years that show. But the thing is, is that I make sure it's a, it's a great environment, that there's positive energy, that there's helpful instructors, and that the people who partner with me to do this event, they really have, you know, pride of ownership in terms of their participation, and they want to see this thing grow as much as I do. So, for me, it's a labor of the labor of love. It's almost like the tail that's wagging the dog. You know, this became like a like a community service project, but it is hands down the biggest thing that I do every year, man. And it gives me more fulfillment out of all that I do in the gun rights community and. I'm really proud of, of this event, and I'm looking to do 
a thousand women in one day next year, the weekend after Mother's Day. That's wow. my goal, a thousand women. So you just said no, it's crazy. you you just said it, the project has kind of become so big that it's it's the tail wagging the dog was your term. But can you? I mean, Rebecca, can you imagine if everyone put in just an inkling of the amount of effort into educating other people about their rights and their freedoms as as he has done? That that is that is the example that we look for. That's absolutely what we're looking for, um, particularly on this show, but I mean, just in our everyday life. Um, I thought it was really interesting. They said that it was, uh, it, it's a, become kind of a community service project. I'm interested mm-hmm. to know how many of these 814 women are from your community and how far has your reach become? Because our community has, I mean, the term has kind of changed over the years, what with uh, the internet and the accessibility for people all over the nation to find out about your project here. So how far away are, are these women coming from for, for this class? You know, most of the women are from Metro Detroit. I get some people who will come from upper Michigan. I've even had some people cross in from Ohio, come over. You know, because Detroit, you know, we're only about an hour, you know, north of the Ohio border. But uh, one thing that has really been encouraging to me has been the fact that, you know, people have heard about this project. And there are some other people who are doing different projects that are, are I find to be very impressive. And, you know, when you go to events like uh, the NRA annual meeting or the Gun Rights Policy Conference every year, you get to network with these folks. And there is interest in replicating this project, you know, in other states and other cities across the country. The thing is, is that from talking to people and they look at the complexity of, of the project, it, it's really a huge project. I just have the benefit of growing it from ground one and, and have made procedural changes to how we do things to make it happen. It's kind of, you know, you have this huge project and just on the fly every year you make necessary adjustments to make it grow and to facilitate training a whole bunch of people. But if I was to say, okay, here's the project plan to train 800 women in a day and I just drop this huge manual, which doesn't exist, by the way, but I drop a huge (laughs) manual on your desk to say, hey, make it happen. You know, it can be rather, you know, rather daunting and challenging. But uh, the thing that I've been most encouraged about is that I see myself at a crossroads with this project. You know, it's either I make an effort to, you know, put together some type of program where advocates and Second Amendment supporters or just people who care about, you know, the safety of women you know, where we could put something together like an official program and they can just replicate it in other communities across the country. Or if there's no desire or interest to do that, then I'll look at it as an opportunity for me to step my game up and take my show on the road and try to replicate it in other states. So that's the crossroads I'm at. I think I take I, this thing beyond Michigan and beyond Metro Detroit. I think do the, I try the, to clone myself or do I go out and just do it myself because no one else is going to do it? Well, I think that I think that's probably some of both of that is that you know you can you can definitely you know share your program and I think that there are so many people that a would need to do it and b would give you credit for having done it and also you know you did it in Detroit. Well, people say, well, you know, Detroit, you know, it's a lost city. No, it's never been a lost city. No, people in Detroit don't think that. And, you know, you, you've also opened up uh, a thought process. You've introduced people to their rights. You've introduced people to a community um, and that sense of community. And we know the news does a terrible job of not sharing what goes on in, in, in Chicago and in Detroit and Baltimore and cities we sometimes read about. And they um, they ignore that. And, but but the people who live there in those places don't get to ignore that. And you've shown them that community, their rights, their ability to defend themselves, to do those things. And that's awesome. And, uh, you know, part of what Rebecca and I do in this show is not only to share your example, but as we can connect with other people 
to maybe help you spread your program and, and spread, spread Rick around a little too. Um, that, that's really the idea is that there are other cities and there are going to be cities that look like Detroit and cities that don't look like Detroit. And right. I'm just talking about big right. city, small city, rural, whatever. But I think a lot of people can learn about what Rick did. And, you know, help, you know, you can say, well, look, I, you know, I approached, you know, range this way and I approached ammunition manufacturers this way. And I was able to get, you know, mm-hmm. enough handguns to do it this way. And you can't be everywhere, uh-huh. but sharing your plan and sharing who you are and, and maybe helping you get a class started in Toledo, uh, you know, things like that. Um, I, my, 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 my folks come from down that way, but um, that is, that is the power of what you're doing. And, and it's awesome, and, and we kind of need to get that out there a lot. Well, the thing is, man, if there are people out there who feel that there's just something that they want to, you know, replicate in their local community, let me tell you, I am all for it. Because I'll tell you what, there are many stereotypes and misconceptions people have about women and with guns. You know, if you listen to certain people in, in the media or on social media, they'll have you believe that, Hey, women have no desire to take on a more active role in their personal protection. They don't want to learn how to op- safely operate guns. They don't want to how to protect their families and their, their their babies. And I'm telling you, no matter what you may hear in the media, there's nothing. There's been nothing but a positive response, and it grows every year. And there's like this community that has grown around the event, and that's like a secondary, you know, benefit of doing this project, man, is that I want to foster the women that come to this event, you know, not just to rely on this event, but network amongst themselves when they come in, because that's what keeps them from going to the gun range. They don't have anyone to go to the gun range with where they don't feel comfortable with sharing their desire to learn more about guns. And there's no guide, you know, someone there to actually, you know, take them by the hand or say, hey, let's meet up at the gun range and let's do this. There needs to be a community around that. And you know what? There has been a community that has grown up around this event. And it's a great thing to witness and to behold. Let me tell you what. To a person, male and female, in terms of my instructors, I'm a training counselor to the NRA, and I train people to be firearms instructors. And one of the ways that I got a lot of instructors to work this event is not only because I network with a bunch of instructors, but I've also trained a lot of people to be instructors. And so as a side effect, I've trained a few, quite a few women to be instructors. So that definitely helps. And the more people we get to buy into the project and the more women that I can train to be firearms instructors to be fellow you know, supporters of events like this, man, that's going to help, you know, this event grow even more. But I tell you, it's a labor of love and to a person, man or woman who works the event as fellow instructors or range safety officers, at the end of the day, you know, we're tired, you know, and we're hungry and we have a big meal afterwards at a local restaurant. There is no greater feeling that we all to a person feel about a job well done, knowing that we've put a lot of women on the path of personal protection and self-defense. And there's no greater feeling. So um, the power of mom is something that Rebecca and I talk about a lot. And um, that is um, that is something that Rebecca does. And, you know, she's, she runs a group called A Million Moms Against Gun Control. And they... Um, they are trying to reach out to as many moms as they can to educate them. And I not only wanted to have this conversation because I wanted to know what you were doing, but I also wanted to have this conversation so that I, I'm pretty sure you two know of each other. Uh, but to uh, take maybe a little bit of your idea and and make sure that, you know, Rebecca could, you know, spread that among her, her moms too. And because a mom is a mom 
And, you know, that is, yeah. that is an awesome, an awesome thing. You know, here at my house, we do call it the power of mom because if mom's not happy, nobody's happy. And I'm, I'm kidding, but <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. But, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. If mom's engaged and involved and, and she's interested and she feels comfortable with it, then, then we are going to, you know, it'll be an acceptable practice and it's something that we all talk about and do. And as Rebecca, I mean, Rebecca was just telling me the other day, I mean, I do my thing, but you're, Rebecca, you were saying, you know, kids spend a lot more time with mom than probably dads, dads realize if, if dads are home and, and, um, you know, Rick, we want to share your idea as far as we can. Well, I'm going to tell you, networking is huge, man. Cause I, uh, I make it a point to go to the GRPC gun rights policy conference every year. And because I'm making plans to go this year, it's actually going to be in Phoenix. So, this will be the impetus behind me making my first ever trip to the state of Arizona. But uh, to go and see what other people are doing, you know, and there are some people who are doing some amazing stuff in the gun community. There's one guy, like his name escapes him right now, but he's out of Ohio. And his thing is where he goes into the schools and they train teachers. They train, they're training our teachers in guns in Ohio how to operate guns and how to use them for self-defense such that if they have given the opportunity that we could actually have armed teachers in schools. And I don't know about if the laws have, you know, changed that allows them to do that. But even if the law doesn't allow them to do that, he's willing to take this program and lead the way such that if the law does allow it or will allow it in the future, there's already this army of teachers who are willing to do that. So just being able to meet like-minded people who are doing things, you know, maybe not exactly what you're doing, but taking the leadership role in promoting uh, guns for personal protection and self-defense, you know, it's so empowering and it's so invigorating every year that I go. I go just to network with the fellow you know, leaders of gun rights at the grassroots level, which is basically what the GRPC is. It has everyone from every gun group all across the country with an emphasis on, you know, what people are doing locally. And I like sharing what I do, and I like hearing what other people are doing. And you know what? Not only am I helping other people and giving them ideas, but I'm also the beneficiary of what other people are doing in their respective communities. And you know what? When I leave and I come back back to Detroit, man, I'm psyched up. I'm like walking on clouds, just really impressed with what fellow gun right advocates are doing across the country. And I get to share with what I'm doing so that if someone feels like they want to try something along the lines of what I'm doing, let them know that I'm here and I'm available and I'm willing to help. So at the... Tell us about since, since we've got since you introduced that point. How would people get a hold of you? We'll we'll actually catch up on that again at the end of the show. But what's the best way to get you and see what you're doing on your program? Man, I am literally all over the place. I, I'll tell you this: if someone is interested in finding me, if you have an internet connection on a laptop or a cell phone, there's no way you can miss me. My name is Rick R I C K, last name X T E C T O R. Legally Armed in Detroit is like my advocacy uh, group site that I direct a lot of people to. But I'll tell you, if you are on social media at all, Can't miss Rick. Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, whether it's LinkedIn, all the major social media sites, I am there. And usually... My handle on those sites is Detroit CCW, all one word strung together. Okay, Literally, we, there's no way you can miss. It. We will put that in the in the show notes in the link to the show, and so when people are listening to this, if they if they missed all that, we will make sure that there are active links for as much as we can find. Uh, we'll run that all by Rick too, so people will absolutely get a chance to see it, click on it, uh, share, and. We encourage anyone who catches this show because the show is not recorded live uh, to later uh, connect with Rick. Rick will be at the GRPC in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and I believe that um, GRPC is September, and I'm scrolling through my calendar 14th. here. 
the 20th, right? 20th. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that weekend. So um, if you have a chance and you are there, um, absolutely bump into Rick and have a conversation about how you can bring his program to your city. We're going to get Rick to make a manual. We can't make another Rick, so we're going to get Rick to make another manual. Uh, but uh, Rick Rick will travel, apparently, so that's good. Um, so, Rick, you talked about GRPC. So let's let's spend a little minute talking about GRPC. But let's before we do that, there's an event that happens before GRPC, and that is about – it's for podcasters. Are you familiar with that event? I'm very familiar with it. It's just that I'm not a podcaster. You know, there was a time when I had an interest in podcasting. I looked into it, and I was like, you know what? I'm not willing at that time to devote all the time it takes to get proficient at it. But I'll tell you, the people <laughs> yes. who are doing yeah. it, uh-huh. I, I, I salute them, and they have my highest respect for what they do. You know, my mentor, Ken Blanchard, he runs Black Man with a Gun. That podcast has been up probably 20 years now, and all the info and stuff that he had. And that's how I got into gun rights advocacy. But, uh, you know, right now, I'm, I'm exploring something a little more interesting. I think down the road soon, I want to get a video. You know, I have a, a site, you know, on uh, YouTube. But I want to start doing just a like a video magazine or a video blog where I just put all my advocacy sites on video. A lot of stuff that I have on YouTube is centered around the, the media appearances I've had locally, regionally, and nationally. And every now and then I'll put up some instructional stuff. But I think I'll put up some advocacy stuff. So I think that'll just be a natural addition. I'll just mix it in with all my other stuff. No need to add. So you're getting down. into the media, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so that's, that's well, happening. I mean, it, yeah. It's the wave of the future, it is. you know, and, is. and, and quite, you know, you know, to be you know very blunt, man, video is where it's at. If you want to get uh, something out to the people, you know, it's going to require you to step your game up and to, you know, get at least proficient with creating a video. It, and you know what? A little bit of, you know, training and video editing and maybe a nice little theme song and a few graphics. It doesn't seem like the learning curve is too bad compared to those podcasters, man. Let me oh. tell you, that <laughs> podcast learning curve seems, seems to be a little tough, man. But I think I could probably navigate the video in a lot better. If not, I do know that there's that site. Fiverr, man. You can just go out to that website and just give them your stuff and let them do it, and they'll knock it out for five bucks. You know? There you go. And um, if, if the most important thing is that, that you have something to share and show, uh, and that's what they're going to do at the at the event. I think it's called AmCon, I believe. Um, now, tell us about GRPC because um, I've I've all I'm usually on the road doing politics then, and everyone's like, "You should come. We'll talk about grassroots." And I'm like, "All my friends are at GRPC, but I'm I'm knocking on doors in Virginia." Uh, so tell us right. about GRPC because both Rebecca and I probably should eventually figure out how to be there instead of where we currently are. So tell well, us about I, that. I'll tell you how I first found out how I first found out about it again. You know, Ken Blanchard, Black Man with a Gun. I found his site. And uh, he mentioned that he was going to be at the GRPC, the Gun Rights Policy Conference, that year. It might have been 10 years ago. It was in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. And uh, I had been making plans to do some, you know, on-the-road stuff, traveling and going to conferences and stuff. And I had talked about it with some friends, and they kind of pulled up lame at the last second and didn't go. And so I didn't go. And then that one year when it was in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, I said I was going even if I had to drive by myself. And you know what? That's what I did. I drove by myself and didn't know a single soul there. But what I will say about the GRPC is that even though there are literally hundreds of people representing every niche in the gun rights community, everyone there is so open, so friendly, and so helpful that it's like you're instantly bonding with all these kindred spirits from all over the country. And so that first year, after I was following Ken Blanchard around like a lost puppy, you know, 
and he couldn't shake me and get rid of me. So I guess he decided he might as well befriend me. But you get <laughs> to meet and see all these great people who are doing all these great things all over the country. And you can't help but be impressed with people who are actually literally, they are the boots on the ground in their respective communities all over the country. And you just come away impressed with some of the amazing things that they're doing. And you, you meet a lot of people who actually become friends, man. And you find out that over the, the year between, you know, this year's GRPC and the next year's GRPC, there's some synergies that, that are at play there. And if they have podcasts or they have blogs or some other type of, of vehicle, you know, where you can cross promote and appear on each other's programs and get more exposure and more networking and get more detailed info on how they do their activities in their local communities. So I would say if you're interested in gun rights, particularly if there's something that you would like to see in your community, I can think of no greater investment of your time to go check it out one weekend. Sounds, you know, sounds usually, awesome. It's, it's usually a Friday through Sunday deal, but within the last couple of years, they added uh, another component on Thursday night. So now it's like a four day deal. Now I haven't taken them up on this extra day yet, but I'm going to do it soon. We will, you know, put, we will put the link for Arizona, that. This year it's in Arizona, so it's it's outside of my comfort zone for driving because, you know, I have no qualms about jumping in a car and driving 12 hours, but I think Phoenix, Arizona is more than 12 hours. From it's more place. than 12 hours, so, yeah. You're, and you're not even going to drive through too many you know, states. Those states are big out there. They are. Yeah, and, you know, and the, and the thing is, you know, I, I've, I've – you know, years ago, I learned how to legally fly with, with a checked gun and your baggage. So have gun, we'll get on a plane, we'll travel, we'll deplane and get my gun and go anywhere. So There you go. There you, you go. I, I do that part of it often. Uh, we will put the links to GRPC and AMCON in the show notes as well because that absolutely came up. Uh, so, Rick, you have done – awesome things and you've had a lot of challenges and you've mentioned Ken Blanchard and you've also mentioned some of your instructors. Have there been, have there been some stumbling blocks in, in the process? I, sh I, I, uh, the reason why I ask is because what, what we, Rebecca and I often meet people and they, they feel like they can't do something and they are crippled by, I can't, or people say, well, you know, yeah. somebody else should do it. Okay. Well, cool. You right. didn't do that. Uh, you were like, look, right. I have to do this. So what did you do? Were there some, share with some, with some of that. Man, with us, let, me would. Tell you, let me tell you, if, if at any time during this conversation, I gave the impression that it was easy. Let me tell you, I am sorry <laughs> for deluding you. Yeah. I, I may sound positive and upbeat about as I describe my journey, but no, it was not easy. But see, here's the thing. If something is e is, is worth doing, you know, you will do what's required, man. You know, like finding firearms instructors is donate their time, you know, for, a program, a project that's brand new that has never been done before. I mean, you can't do that with people in general unless they have a personal investment in you as a person, as a friend, where they're buying into you and your vision, and they're looking for you to lead the way, and you just have to have a big enough ego and a big enough vision to get people to follow you and to help you, because Bottom line, people are just going to have to like you. If people like you, they will help you. They don't necessarily want to take a leadership role. They want you to be the leader. They're following you because they like you and they support you. In terms of getting a gun range to donate their facility, man, you can walk into a ton of gun ranges and ask me how I know because I've done it. You can walk into a ton of gun ranges and say, hey, I have this beautiful idea. It's a win-win proposition. Give me your lowest 
extended day of the year where you can literally hear crickets chirping in the gun range when all your staff are there and they're bored out of their minds. What day of the year is that? And that was my proposition to these guys. Mm -hmm. And I said, give me your slowest day of the year and I will fill this place up with women who are the fastest growing segment of the gun community. And I will guarantee you that they all have an interest in guns, right? And who are all looking to learn about guns, training classes, and to rent guns and to buy guns. And you can't just buy a gun and be done. I mean, you need a holster, you need ammunition, you need training, you need extra magazines, you need equipment bags, safety glasses, hearing protection. There's this rabbit hole that you go down when you become a gun owner and a gun toter or a gun carrier, you know, where you're just going to need a bunch of stuff and a bunch of training. And you know what? To me, it was the most logical pitch to make to a uh, gun range operator owner, you know, how could you, you know, present a win-win proposition to a guy and they not take you up on it? And you know what? I got rejected a lot of times, man. but see, if you really believe in what you're doing, you know, rejection is just part of the deal. I wish I could tell people out there who hear this podcast that all you need is a great idea you know, and then magical things will happen. No, you're going to have to put in the work. You're going to have to befriend people that you do not know. You're going to have to go places you have not gone, yep. have conversations you have not had. And just by the sheer force of will and the conviction that you have and your powers of persuasion as best as you can muster it, you have to convince people to buy into your vision and to join you. And you know yeah, what? If, I'll tell you, from my, from my experience, you can do it. If I can do it, I know someone else can do it. Yes. Well, Rick, uh, what I'd like to know is um, basically what you're saying is you've been networking and building up this community and things like that. And we all in in the community understand that an armed society is – for real, a polite society. Mm -hmm. But you also were mentioning the fact that you are on all of the social medias, which we know that social media is not such a polite society. So have you personally, especially when you mentioned YouTube, have you personally had any of the pushback um, from social media that others have seen? Oh, for sure, man. Anytime... You have, let me tell you, I don't care what the topic is. All you need to do is express a strong, deeply held conviction or opinion about something, anything, and you will find someone who is diametrically opposed to you, who will want to argue with you and debate you and berate you and try to belittle what you're doing. That's just the cost of doing business and guns is definitely no different because in some areas, depending on what part of the country you're from or what community in that part of the country, you're going to find there are going to be people who do not like you. And why don't they like you? They don't like you because you have this idea in your head that it's okay to embrace the Second Amendment, that you, you know, own a gun and that you're a gun owner and that you train and that you advocate People legally carry guns wherever they can just in case they have a need to protect themselves or to protect their children. And you know what? There's a natural pushback against that. But, you know, undaunted, you have to go forward. And when you're in social media, let me tell you, you don't need any special skills or talents to voice your opinion, however misinformed it is on social media. There are people who will say things however rude and impolite they may be on social media that they would never say to you in person. You know, it's a level of anonymity that it gives people and it emboldens people to say and do things that they would never do in person and in public. But see, the thing is, is that like most things, there's two sides to every point. For every negative experience or negative encounter that you'll have with someone who just hates your ideas about freedoms and guns, you'll find that there are other people out there 
who absolutely adore what you're doing. And even when you have some of these debates in public on these forums and these forms of social media, and you get into these knockdown, drag out, but polite debates in social media, there are people who might not necessarily communicate or share their own thoughts or opinions, but they're still watching and they're still reading. And how you respond and what you share, people will contact you and they will join you and they will follow you. Actually, there's actually there was a time when I loved controversy. You know, mm-hmm. I would love to get into all of these debates because it got more eyeballs to watch and more people to listen and pay attention. So I imagine you're too busy actually, now to, to do that. Yeah. And you know what? I can't do a lot of those things that I used to do and would love to do it, but I can't, you know, but uh, don't I, let pushback, you know, be a deterrent. I think you also know, had debates. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I think controversy is good. I think debate is good. Sure. You know, I I think it's healthy. It's healthy not only to, you know, share what you believe and find other people who believe what you believe, but it also strengthens your argument. And it also will show you in quick order if there's any weaknesses in in any of your beliefs and areas where you need to do research and you need to become even better than you were before. So sure. it, it's all win-win. Self-improvement for sure. You know, the the thing about social media is that, of course, you know, you run into the naysayers, the people that cause debate, the people who can shout you down. And you mentioned it, you know, the whole keyboard warrior. It's very easy to be brave behind a keyboard. But when you invite that person to the range or you say, look, and they, you find out when they're arguing with you that they've never touched a gun before and that they're, they're in fearful of fully semi-automatic, you know, guns, fully semi-automatic. I'll say that again. Uh, it is that they don't know anything. So they're, they're, they're arguing from a place, not always, but of, of, uh, cause it can't certainly take away awful things that have happened to people before. But when people have no experience at all and then they, they spew, and I say spew because if you're spewing, you're, you're buying somebody else's argument. And what it sounds like what you've done just in your program and in social media is you've taken the time to show people not who are actively against you, but who may not otherwise have done that or taken the invitation to do that. And in social media, by showing you what you do, I hope you do the video stuff uh, is to um, it's not always as you believe, because social media is a very powerful thing, but it is also t- it taken is. the human element strangely out of our world where we can interact like I'm looking at Rebecca on a screen. She's sitting in Kansas and I'm sitting in Tennessee and we're calling you on the phone from Michigan. Uh, that's very cool and it's neat and we can communicate. But what it, um, if we weren't having a conversation to try and educate people, it could be a heck of a conversation that where we, we disliked each other and so much could be uh, done in the opposite direction. So kind of anyone who challenges you or anyone else, I challenge them to make it personal by taking the time to go to the range and meet people like Rick and not – just get stuck in, well, I, I don't, I, I don't want to do that. Well, maybe you don't, but maybe you should probably stop being the negative person and start being the person who goes, maybe I don't really know everything. So, I mean, Rick, you've shown that that's the case. You know, and I've had, you know, I remember this one experience, not too many years ago, but it was this woman from Chicago of all places. She was visiting, you know, someone here in Metro Detroit who had already made plans to come to the women's shooting event and, well, they didn't want to be left in a foreign city, you know, all alone because this person was truly committed to going. So they tagged alone too and they brought along their anti gun sentiments and anti gun feelings with them. And lo and behold, they actually took part in the program and they shot a gun and learned firearm safety. And instantly, in just that one moment, we converted someone who was operating from fear and ignorance to being someone who was open to guns and personal protection and self-defense. And that's literally what it's all about. You talk about social media being an echo chamber, you know, of among certain people who have anti-gun sentiments, but they've never seen a gun. They've never operated a gun. They're merely repeating stuff that they heard other people say. Well, when you engage in these community events and you're actually making it real and you're making those experiences tangible and you're actually giving them some useful factual information and you're giving them some real 
personal experiences in the shooting booth one-on-one, you know, I can show you better than I can tell you. And there's there you so much information, in the, especially in the black community, man. So much negative stuff about guns and then it gets perpetuated by certain local media. And you know what? It's not until people just open their minds up to think that maybe everything that they're seeing and reading uh, in the newspaper and on TV, maybe they might be misled a bit. You know, I would say just take it on a leap of faith. Sure. Take a, take a step forward. Look and check it out. I'm sure you'll learn more than you've been told. Well, and you know, I what, what I've seen in, in just my my travels politically, I show up and people go, "Well, you're this guy. I think you got your figured out." I'm like, "Really? I stand for the Constitution." And they say, "Well, what does that mean?" I said, "Well, they're your rights too." I'm like, "You know?" They say, "Well, aren't you a, a this label or a that label?" I said, "Yeah, I might be those things, but my role here is not to tell you that those things don't belong to you too." And it doesn't matter if I have a D or an R next to my name. I still want you to have those fundamental rights. And I think so many people for so long have tried to make guns political when they're constitutional. And that that understanding is what you're showing people is like, you know, people may look different. They may be different. But these rights belong to you. This is something that belongs to you. And I've seen the pictures of, of the classes of happy, awesome moms and ladies holding these pictures up. And, you know, the cool, the coolest part about it is they're all different, different, different sides. You know, and, different- re- and I'm really glad that you brought that up because when I became a homeowner years ago, when I back when I was married, man, and, uh, you know, I bought a, a 12 gauge shotgun, not because I had an affinity towards a shotgun, but because I do, you know, it's this stereotype that, Hey, well, yeah, <laughs> see, different experiences, different up around different environment, different upbringing, right? Yep. Yep. And so True enough. I just had a 12 gauge and a shotgun because, you know, I was told I had to have one. And so I had one, but in terms of carrying a gun, even though shell issue became the law of the state, you know, those years ago, I believe back in 2001, I had no interest, had no desire. What in the world did I need a gun for? I was a homebody, family guy, you know, family man. You know, I didn't need a gun. All I did was go to work and come home, right, and spend time with the family on the weekends. But, see, it wasn't until I was robbed at gunpoint in my own driveway that I suddenly had an epiphany, right? Wow. After I survived that event of being robbed in my driveway – I said, well, you know what? Maybe I should stop letting other people think for me, and maybe I should do some independent research for myself instead of just buying, you know, these these publicly published opinions from people who don't care about my safety. Yeah, you can call the police, but gee, when you have a gun shoved in your face by two thugs in your driveway, what good is that going to do? You know, and I just and I'm just so thankful. And so proud and so happy that, one, I survived that ordeal. And, two, that I took it upon myself to do some independent research and find some other voices out there who were espousing, you know, personal protection, empowerment, and self-defense, where I empowered myself to, one, buy a gun, and, two, to get training, and, three, to get a concealed carry permit and take all the admonishments they gave me to heart not let that be the only training that I actually received and I just kept going. I just literally devoured everything I could find about guns, empowerment, personal protection and it got to a point, man, where I couldn't learn anymore unless I became an instructor. So that's what I did. Became an instructor. And then that wasn't enough. I wanted to learn how to train instructors and I just keep following this rabbit hole, you know, and then You know, I find gun rights advocacy to now be my passion. And so you find other gun rights advocacy, you know, advocates that are out there, man. And it's just a big, giant rabbit hole. And I feel like Alice, and I'm continually to follow this path, man. I tell you, it is single-handedly the most fulfilling journey I have been on in my life. Well, Well, I guess I should – I can – that – from from driveway to who Rick is now, I guess to tell more people be like Rick because Rick, you took some, you took a negative experience, and we can in our conversations with people, just in the friends we have that we've talked to, all, not on the air, but just as our friends, a lot of people have taken 
negative experiences, horrific experiences in, in some cases uh, where somebody died, like Nikki Gozier's uh, husband died in front of her, and she mm-hmm. could have never wanted to see or touch a gun ever again. And I don't think too many people would have mm-hmm. blamed her at all. And she decided, mm-hmm. no, I'm going to tell my message. And she did her thing and wrote her book, and she advocated her way. And what you did mm-hmm. was in the middle of your driveway, you're like, I lived through this. I need mm-hmm. to I need to learn. And that is we we certainly don't wish ill will on anyone. We don't. That's not what we're here for. Right. That's not what we want. But if you can take a negative experience and make it a positive one, that's all the more powerful. And then Rick, you did something that I think most instructors would be horribly scared of. All this, you know, fifty people on the range is is a lot, you know. Uh and then you mm-hmm. And then you and then you add in the classroom segment and, and you create this rotation. You created this huge program uh, to to mm-hmm. begin the education and the and the understanding of something. And now you're approaching your goal is a thousand people in a day. And the thing is, is that you've done this for years. I don't doubt that every single lady le- there leaves with an understanding of how to properly fire a handgun, how to do, you know, how to be safe with that, how to have some understanding. Uh, and, and you're just beginning to show them that. And that is, that is awesome. That is something that um, I actually don't know anyone else in the firearms industry that does it to that number or to that, that has that. And that, that is A, why we wanted to talk to you, uh, but B, we want to spread it because we think it's awesome. That that's that's why. Let me tell you, there's no reason why this mindset. Not, and here's the thing about guns and gun rights: if you take the greater lesson from this, it can apply to any other area of your life. Real literally, you know. Really, you just have an idea and a passion, and you just follow it through. And no, everything is not going to be perfect. No, the stars are not going to line up. And you're going to have this path in front of you and you're just going to follow it and everything works out. No, you just have to have this vision of what you want to accomplish. Unseen forces will appear when you need them. You know, I even think you have a certain level of consciousness where your brain is actively looking for solutions that you just blindly walk past because they weren't relevant to you. Just know what it is that you want. And get on that path and just walk it, man. And you will meet people and you will experience this, you will experience circumstances, man, that will help you on your journey. It's like one of those classic storybook fairy tales that you read. You know, the person is going on this heroic journey, right? He doesn't know where he's going, but he knows he has a goal and just people you meet along the way just help you as they appear when you need them. I couldn't agree with that more, Rick. Just know what you want and just follow it. And man, unseen forces will come to your aid. I I agree with that a million percent. I'm talking to someone on the phone, Rick Rick Ector, who who is that? I met Rick um, and you've been in my journey. I met Rebecca that way. I didn't, had I not gone down my road, I wouldn't have. So you're right. Sometimes you just got to go down that road. And you know, I, th- first of all, I want to thank you. We're not we're not kicking you off the show yet. Uh, it's we're not over. We have we have another segment. But uh, we, you know, right. kind of wrapping that up is that we're going to make sure that all the show links, all the links to all the things you've discussed, um, we're going to have a link to you. And when you start posting videos, we'll certainly be sharing that on our social media because we really want to spread the message of who Rick is and what you do. We love to see those smiling faces of the ladies and your instructors uh, making a difference. Uh, that's huge to us personally and to um, to the firearms community at large. So that is, you know, cheers to you, Rick and Charge. Keep going. You know, that's that's awesome. Um, we are going to try and add a segment. Well, I'm not going to say we're going to try. We are doing it. We're adding a segment about uh, a book, and I made this really cool sound. So we have to we have to listen to it. So hang on. Okay. You don't have to burn books to destroy a culture. Just get people to stop reading them. Ray Bradbury. We ask each of our guests to share an important book from their lives, and we're going to put it on our virtual To the Republic bookshelf found on our website, totherepublic.us. As our library grows, so too will the wit, wisdom, and knowledge of our guests be shared with our listeners.
Rick, why don't you share what the book is that you we would put on our bookshelf? Yeah, man, there, there, there is a book that, that literally like, that got me going down this journey, man. And uh, I came across it several years ago. Maybe, I don't know, man, it might be 12, 14, 15 years ago. Good friend of mine, he's a great friend of mine now, uh, Ken, Black Man with the Gun Blanchard, he wrote a book entitled Black Man with the Gun. You know, this was a, a book I found when I was trying to do research into what I was trying to accomplish here locally in Detroit. That is to uh, evangelize, you know, black people and guns. And so I went to Google and I typed in this phrase. I typed in literally with no prior knowledge, black man with a gun. And I saw Ken Blanchard and his book appear. I immediately ordered it. I received it. I devoured it. And it was a very instrumental and influential book to me and my walk, not only as a firearms trainer, but as a gun rights advocate. If you really wanted to learn about the the history of gun control and even the racist roots of gun control, this was literally the book that got me started. You know, all the negatives that we see about guns in the community or guns in the media or guns on the national news, it it has absolutely nothing to do with guns and nothing to do with safety at its root. Gun control is all about control. And this is the thing that the founding fathers of this country, you know, were acutely aware of. If you have a people who are unable to defend themselves, they can be controlled and ultimately enslaved. You look across the globe and you see all the people who have been disarmed and you look at all the the communities and the governments and under which they live upon the, live under, you realize that you actually cannot have freedom without the ability to protect yourself. And I am so glad, let me tell you, to be an American citizen, to have the Second Amendment, and to have resources and patriots and advocates such as Ken Blanchard. He wrote his book, Black Man with a Gun. It was the book that literally got me started on my journey to gun rights advocacy. And I would strongly suggest that if you have not read this book, that you pick it up and read it as soon as possible. I'm going to do it, and we will share it on our bookshelf. Um, You know, just as a, a thought process there at the end, you said perhaps one of my favorite words, which is citizen. I love the word because that means you're engaged, you're involved, you're not just too many people in this day and age have become, and I I, I say it too much, but, uh, you know, being a citizen is way better than being a subject. Subject is overrated. And only when you engage and participate in our republic, because we don't live in a democracy, um, are are we going to um, actually affect change? And, And people struggle with, well, do we always have to do this? Do we always have to fight to keep our rights? Yes, eternal vigilance is necessary. And what you're doing through your education of other people uh, and teaching them you know, what it means to be a citizen uh, is, is the beginning. And uh, you've done an awesome job of that. And that's really what this show is all about, is engaging people in their republic and pointing out examples of People who get stuff done. And that's why we wanted to have a conversation with you. And we're going to share you on our social media, not only with this show, which uh, the show won't even be available until August 1st when we actually launch the show in the network. But we're going to continue to share what you're doing on our social media for the show, for sure. Yeah, man. And just to piggyback on what you just said, man, you know, the fact that freedom, you know, is but a lot of people, they don't truly understand what it means. It doesn't mean that you uh, will be protected. You know, to totally be free, you have adopted and embraced the fact that you and you alone are responsible for your safety. And as a matter of fact, the Supreme Court has had at least one, if not two major uh, decisions in which they have confirmed that safety is your responsibility. It is not the government's responsibility. It is your safety. 
If you become a crime victim, as people have in the past, you cannot sue the government for not being there, for not being summoned in a timely fashion to protect you. That is your job. And you know what? I embrace it, and I am glad that it is my job because I will do what's required to protect me and my family, and I will fight against anyone that tries to diminish my ability to protect myself and my family. And there's this one movement that's really going across the country that irks me to no end. You know, these so-called red flag laws where someone who, for whatever reason, is deemed to be a threat, even though they have broken no laws, but yet and still you want to petition the government through a secret court proceeding to come in the middle of the night, raid this person's home, and take their guns until this person proves, you know, after he's already been punished, that he's no longer a threat. There is, I'll tell you, no more un-American concept or idea that exists right now, and it's a cancer that that's literally growing in our country because some people are not willing to embrace their rights and to actually use them. Man, we I am could not freedom. agree with that more. Indeed. Um, Rick, we really appreciate having you uh, as our guest, and we cannot wait to share what you are doing with our sphere of influence and so that they can go and in turn share it with their own. Uh, we really wish you the best in all of your efforts and everything, and we're excited to see what happens next. Thanks for joining us, Rick. I, Hang on. I, I, I am thankful for y'all having me on the show. It has truly been an honor and a privilege. It is not the critic who counts, not the person who points out how the strong stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to those who spend themselves in a worthy cause. Who at best, in the end, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if they fail, at least fails while daring greatly. Their place shall never be with those cold, timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Taken from the words of Theodore Roosevelt. Thank you for joining us on To The Republic. Please visit our website, totherepublic.us, to learn more about your co-hosts as well as our current and upcoming guests. Be sure to check us out on Instagram and Facebook too. Catch you next time on To The Republic. Keep your head down and your powder dry. Yours in Liberty, Rebecca Schmoy and Timothy Knight.